I'm Dr. Cassie Preston, a mental performance coach and founder of CP Mindset. And today we're diving into an interview with one of my clients, Noah Cavanaugh, a professional soccer player for Flower City Union in New York. It was fun for me to get his perspective on how he's been able to personalize his mental game to work for him, specifically helping him overcome some pretty big challenges as he's continued to rise the ranks of pro soccer in the U.S. Key takeaways include the reciprocal nature of focusing on the process and staying centered, staying even keel through the ups and the downs by letting go of the fantasies and the nightmares, developing a me versus me mentality and the use of his personal scorecard, taking a playful approach to the mental game and staying adaptable throughout a season, and lastly, enjoying the game for the sake of itself and improving his mood after games regardless of his performance. Make sure to listen to the whole thing as there are lots of other great takeaways and insights on how he has been able to win the mental game. Along with a soccer career, he runs a YouTube channel where he shares his experience as a pro, technical and tactical tips, and boot reviews. Those links will be in the show notes. Before we dive in, a quick reminder to like, subscribe, and all that good stuff. And if you're interested in learning more about our one-on-one mental performance coaching services, you can find out more at cpmindset.com. Enjoy the interview. All right, Noah, thanks for joining me today. I know we've got lots we can talk about and dive into. And what I want to start with is just what's the biggest shift for you when you started thinking about your mental game and the mental prep work we've got to do together and you've done on yourself. What's the biggest shift that you've had in thinking about how to develop your mindset? What would you, how would you answer that question? Putting it down to the most simple phrase, I would say process focus versus outcome focus. And that to me has always been a huge thing Uh, goals, I guess, in the past have often been based on outcomes. So make a certain team, start in X game, uh, make a certain amount of money while playing at the pro game, be the captain of the squad, whatever those goals are, which are great. And those are awesome to keep in mind. Uh, But I found that when we started working together and started really pulling it back to the simple level process focus, what are the everyday things that I can be consistently good at all the time? that then almost made the goals pointless because I achieved all of them. And it was like that I wasn't focused on the big goals. And the process for me has been a massive shift in the way that I think about psychology uh, when it relates to my sport and in in general as well. Yeah. And, and And I love that answer and we'll dive into it. And I got lots of other questions, but one of the challenges, I think traditional sports psych People think like, what's one of the fundamental things sports psych does? Goal setting. (laughs) What are the outcomes you want? Outcomes, outcomes. And I'm always like, okay, we'll talk. I want to know what your goals and expectations are, but it's like, we don't need to talk about them. Like, let's clarify what your process is. So since that's such a big shift and it's so fundamental, focus on what you can't control, focus on the process over the outcomes. But a lot of athletes, like you hear it, but then don't always apply it. And I'm sure we'll get into some of the strategies that have helped you do that. But would you mind going a little deeper just on like, what has that meant for you or what has been defining the process been like for you? And then I've got a bunch of other questions I'll throw your way. Yeah, definitely. So I think for me, the biggest thing was the emotions attached to each one of those goals that I had. So let's say in the, in the case of making a certain squad, if I didn't make that squad, it was a massive letdown on confidence, on belief in myself, on my abilities and all these things. And I think the the emotions behind it fluctuated so much. And I think we've talked a little bit about staying neutral and staying centered. And I think that's been a theme in process because when you focus on process, process is everything you can control. And you're in control, not only of your emotions, but of the things practically speaking on an everyday basis, you can control. And so for me, it was like, not only did I find I had less variability in my emotional reaction to things, but I was also able to narrow it down to, no, I can, I can control my reaction to a stimulus. I can control the the way that I'm going to show up every day. I'm going to control all of those things. And then the rest of the variables around them that sure include some bigger picture goals. Great. That stuff almost falls by the wayside because I'm so focused on being the best version of myself in every single moment, whether it's a prehab exercise, you know, completely alone in the gym this morning before training, no one's watching, no one gives it crap. You know, no one's, you know, no one's sitting there scrutinizing me, but I'm in my head going, I'm going to show up every day as a professional, as a, as the top pro I can. And as soon as that's taken care of, everything else is fine. Cause everything else is, you know, there's 11 other guys on the field. It's, it's super, uh, 
it, it's super variable. So I would say that that, to me, the difference between emotional regulation has also been massive and really taking full control over that piece of it as well. Yeah, I love that answer because, you know, everybody wants to and gets staying even keel. And one of the unique things, and I like the symbiotic relationship you made, well, when I focus on what I can control in my process, it helped me stay even keel and centered. And focusing on being centered and even keel helps you stay focused on your process. And it's like cycling. And and I say it a lot, like I want, and you sure, I'm, I'm sure you've heard me say it numerous times too, stay immersed in the process. Like we want to be yeah. obsessed and consumed with what we can control. And when you do that, it's like, you're not even caught up in all the noise and distractions and being able to detach and let go of that is a big part of being able to be immersed. And so mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll get into that in a bit more. But I wanted to move to what are the biggest obstacles you've had to overcome to getting your mental game to where it is now? What have been the hardest things for you to deal with you know, mentally as a professional athlete? There's a lot of setbacks in the lower tiers of professional athletics in America. And I think I can, you know, I can obviously only speak to that because that's the context where I'm coming from. It could be different for, for other people, but especially in the, in the football, the soccer world, the pay is not great. You potentially could move every season, depending on what's going on. For me, I would say the two biggest since we've been working together have been one was a crazy situation in one team that I ended up moving and transferring halfway through the season. And so that was a huge mental shift of not only how do I take all of this in my own lane. So what, what are all the things I can control? Oh, pretty much everything other than the way I'm going to get treated. Fair enough. I can control my reaction to that. So that's one piece of it. And then the second piece was relatively recently in the last two to three months, I would say, of being a consistent starter on the team, got offered a contract, but basically was told you're going to be the number two guy. You, you know, we brought in somebody who's better than, you know, quote unquote, better than you and, and all this stuff. And to be able to overcome both of those obstacles, most importantly, up here first, and then in actuality, both of them have worked out great. And I'm continuing to obviously improve that. But I think those are two in the literally in the last 12 months that are massive shifts in the way that I think previously it would have taken me a lot longer to work through those obstacles or I would look at them in a way that wasn't framed correctly. And I think being able to not only frame them correctly, but also make sure that I'm, as, as I spoke about before, really focused on I'm in control of my own emotions. So if I come at this with a productive, how do I improve? How do I, it's a me versus me, not me versus another guy, me versus an owner of a club. It's not me versus anyone. It's just, how do I improve myself on a day-to-day -day basis? To me, that was literally game-changing in the way that I was able to snap straight. I mean, it was, I would argue it was probably less than 24 hours when I heard, oh, you're not going to be the starting guy, whatever until the point where I was locked in, ready to go. And it was like, okay, cool. Like, let's, let's bring it. And, yeah. and that's been huge. Yeah, no, I love that. And it's, as you rise the ranks or want to be a high performer in anything in life, there's going to be obstacles and challenges that are out of your control. And then it's, how do you respond to them that matters? And, you know, that kind of leads us into, and you, and you talked about framing, you talked about how you dealt with that and, and making sure your head's right first. What would be some of the top strategies that, you know, on what you did differently than what you have done before that's helped you deal with those obstacles, helped you, you know, improve your mental game and perform better on the field to play? I'd say the first one that pops into my head is the nightmare fantasy exercise. So being able to say, acknowledge that the situation might not be ideal, but there's a lot of benefits to a situation like that. And in the same vein, there might be a situation that's incredible or even honestly a training session, you know, narrow it down to a single day. I might have a training session that literally almost goes perfectly for me, but what are the drawbacks to that? Right. So being able to really kind of even, you talked about even keel earlier, really making sure that those situations uh, are framed in my head as a, as yes, there's caveats to everything, both positive and negative and being able to really kind of stay even keeled in that that's been a helpful exercise. I think the other one that really pops to my head that I've been using recently is um, similar to the immerse in the process type vibe, but the, the, the framing and the words you've used to describe diving deep or getting under, you know, just dive straight into the cold water or whatever, you know, whatever, however you frame that in your own mind, like that diving deep has been massive because I've been able to completely tune out 
all the distractions, which is another word for everything I can't control and completely just saying, okay, cool. I'm here. I'm doing my thing. I know I'm performing well. And, and that has been absolutely sensational for, for me, especially in the last couple of months of battling for that first spot and, and, you know, battling for the starting position and really making sure that it's, it's not a me against him. It's, it's a me versus me. And that I keep coming back to that, but that really is the way that I think about the dive deep piece of it. Yeah, no, I like both of those. And I think, you know, especially from the, you know, we, it comes from Dr. John Martini's work and collapses in that uh, even keel concept and not having fantasies and nightmares. I like to frame it uh, very much around uh, if, if you have these emotional charges on these fantasies and perfections and nightmares and things that are bad and good or bad, it's like, well, you're going to get elated and deflated. And now you're going to be on a roller coaster and everyone knows they don't want to do that. Well, the solution is to, to to debunk it, to collapse the fantasies and the nightmares and just see them as part of the process. And when you get things going your way, great, own it, but don't get, you don't have to get elated by it and vice versa. And then you're, you know, continue to combine that with the, you know, focusing on the, what you can control. And, and, and when you keep doing that, now you're just snowballing in the right directions. What? So those are some concepts and strategies. What about like some of the fundamentals, like the personal scorecard, the alter ego, reset routines, you know, using your imagery script. What have those have been the biggest impact for you out of, out of those four fundamentals? I would say the scorecard has been massive. That's something that I do every day. It's a, it's a ritual for me prior to training, prior to games, regardless of home or away, I find a small quiet space or throw on headphones and, and tune every, you know, all the literal noise out and just focus on being in my own head and really structuring and laying the fundamentals of my thought process where the next 90 minutes of a game, the next two hours of a training session, every single one of those events that's going to happen is built upon the fundamental, that base of that scorecard, some of the visualization exercises, some of the some of the mental imagery stuff that we've gone through. Uh, and then immediately following that, every single day, training, games, doesn't matter. I get into a taping routine, which is part of my, uh, not only the alter ego, but it's also part of the reset routine. And I've been able to get into the point where there may be a moment in a game or a training session where I literally don't have time to physically do my reset routine, the the physical action of it. But in my head, I'm very acutely aware of like, yep, okay, reset, boom, I'm ready to go again. And that stuff has been, it, I mean, that's exactly what you said. It's fundamental. It's, it literally is the base of every single session I do, whether it's solo, whether it's on the pitch, whether it's in training, in a gym, whatever. Oh, I love that. And I love that you picked the, the, the scorecard because not always that's not always everyone's favorite one, but to me, it's like the athletes that engage in that process and identify and focus on what they can control, which then it doesn't surprise me that's your favorite because that's what you're highlighting as one of the biggest and important things. So from the, and for those that don't understand, know exactly what the personal scorecard is, it's just about identifying the things within your control and then reflecting on that's how you score yourself and and focus on what your attention is well defined versus the most common things focus on just playing your game focus on things you control well what are those things <laughs> it's like let's mm -hmm. make that your personal scorecard and if we have that as how you define success and what you score and reflect on daily then you don't need to get so caught up in the external scoreboards and all those results and, and achievements that are your goals and your intentions but we want to detach from that that we talked about and just be immersed here so I love that. I got a couple other things to go a little deeper on. Do you want to say anything else about the personal scorecard and how it ties into keeping you focused on the process? I think you did a good job, but I think it's such a big one. Like you said, the rituals around, is there anything else you want to dive into there? I'd say the biggest thing for me has been the ability for us to adapt to different situations. I mean, from the first time we met and sort of built out what I thought our scorecard, you know, my scorecard would be at the time. That was fantastic. But then as things change, as situations are different, we were able to condense and start to really filter out things that are really ingrained now at this point and really focus on, you know, I've got, I'd say anywhere between on any given day between four and six, like really specific points that I meditate on pre-training. I write them down. It's like a physical act for me. For some guys, it might not be obviously, but 
um, for me, it's very important. You know, I take my take my journal out and I draw it out. I write it out. I'm I'm really meticulous that way. And so and that's been awesome to be able to adapt and change because I know that every situation isn't going to need the same solution or, or same sort of uh, fundamental base. And so being able to adapt, that's been massive for me because I think we've really narrowed it down to the things that are super core to who I want as my alter ego and who I identify with in that way, but also taking, taking advantage of the things that, you know, maybe I still need a little bit of help with on the side and being like every single day, I note it. And then I'm really aware of it during training and I'm able to tackle it as soon as it comes up. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think one of the the points I want to make sure we dive into too, like, what would you say has been the biggest impact uh, for you on the actual field with your performance? Like whether that's offense, defense, you know, just dealing with the distractions. How's how is it tangibly transpired for you on the field of pay, on the field of play or the pitch? I think the three four mindset, the attack mode, has been awesome, and I can I, I've translated that to literally attacking and defending. So it can really go either way. Even in possession, it's like, what is the most effective pass that I'm able to play? And that comes from just simplifying it down to I'm constantly in that attack mode. Like I'm going out and my alter ego is venom. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, that that venom is like, it's very much a part of that, you know, aggressive, not in an angry way, but in a very like relentless pursuit of excellence kind of way. And so both in my pride attacking and defending, that's been really helpful. Um and and yeah, I think I think simplifying it down to the three four attack mode has been massive for me. Yeah, and that's uh, and it's helping. So many athletes get so consumed by the fear of mistakes, mm -hmm. <laughs> like don't want to turn the ball over, don't want to get beat, and trying yeah. to be perfect. And like, no, let's just enjoy the game and attack. Which for me, I got a couple other uh, unique questions. One is around the playfulness or creativeness around taking that to the mental game and just sports and high performance in general how's like and i know you've done a great job with that with your alter egos and your reset routines etc and your personal scorecard but even just on a higher level one of the big things that i've noted with your progress and, and your mindset and the reflections and, and our chats have been around like creating a masterpiece out on the field of play like like reconnecting to like the why and the game itself and even just being creative in that and then tying it all together, how much has that been a factor to your three, four mindset, to your game, to your whole mental game, et cetera, just some of the playfulness, creativeness and, and all the strategies themselves. I'd just be curious your take on that. Definitely. At the end of the day, football, soccer, whatever sport you're playing is a game, right? It's a sport for a reason. We're here to enjoy. And yes, it's part of, you know, it's, it's my work. It's what I make money doing. And I'm, very fortunate to be in that position because it's a tiny percentage of the actual football players in the world. But at the end of the day, I'm here to enjoy it. I'm here to play the game. I'm here to learn life lessons. I'm here to play with the ball. I think we, you know, we've spoken a bunch about that, the, what, whatever artist it was, whatever famous artist it was, I can't even remember the name. Michelangelo, but, uh, maybe. Michelangelo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's even say Michelangelo. So, yeah. you know, he, he, painted like 50,000 pieces and maybe a few of them were the most valuable pieces now in the world. Um, but that doesn't happen if he's not going attack mode at every single one, right? That doesn't happen if he's enjoying it. He's diving into the process. He's, he's continuously going at his craft. And for me, I found a lot of joy in the everyday things. So I find so much joy in going to the gym alone and doing a lift before everybody else gets even to the facility, right? Like that's a, that's the thing that I enjoy. And that's just a process thing. It has nothing to do with in Instagram, like, and it's got nothing to do with goals on the score sheet. I mean, potentially it could translate to that, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the, the masterpiece becomes the process. Like I, I have pride in the process. I have, uh, I'm, I'm very excited every day to wake up and, and do that stuff. And so not only is it creating a beautiful, maybe a beautiful play, a beautiful cross, some, uh, you know, a, a top corner shot, whatever it is, it can be that, but it can also be the, the masterpieces. Like every day I can kind of curate this, this art piece. And some days might not be that masterpiece like Michelangelo, right? You, you have certain percentages that 
that day just wasn't a masterpiece. And that's cool. That's all, that's all good. But because I'm enjoying that and because I'm having fun and I'm, I have joy in each of those moments, that's been fantastic for me. And, and it feels less of, it completely takes the pressure off because there it no, it no longer is a, well, it's a job. I'm going to lose my job. It's, you know, every, it's a nightmare. It's either a nightmare or a fantasy, blah, blah, blah. You take away and you say, we're just here to have fun, work hard, enjoy it, meet people. Like that's, that's what it's about. Yeah, no, I love that. And I think that enjoying the game for the sake of itself, the, you know, getting back in touch with that, especially as you rise the ranks and there's the money, the goals, the inten- there's all these goals and intentions. That's so key because if we can do that, then we can let go of that and then just be immersed in where we are, which then helps us actually more likely get all those goals and intentions. And so, you know, I th- I think that's, you know, I know for most athletes, that's a huge fundamental piece that are constantly reinforcing and you want to stay connected to that. I got a few more questions, but anything else on that aspect of, you know, the love of the game and detaching from the results, like, you know, the screw it's the ability to accept and and the range of results, anything else there that you want to touch on? Otherwise I got a couple other questions to wrap up. No, I think that's it. I mean, again, like joy is the biggest thing and some, sometimes the the greatest moments come out of mistakes. You know, you're, it's what the response to the mistake is what you get highlight reels for, right? Like those are, you know, you make a bad pass, you recover, you win the ball, you assist a goal. You know, that's, that's what gets highlights or whatever. Not that that necessarily matters, but that, you know, that's the stuff that the response to those is all in the name of creating that masterpiece. So for me, that's been an awesome imagery. Awesome. Love it. Okay. A couple of final questions to hammer out here. Hesitations. So before starting a uh, pretty common thing, people are like, I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> like, what Did you have any hesitations about diving in, doing some mental game training and and, and working together or, or doing some of these strategies? How much hesitation did you have initially? You know, what were some of your early concerns? For a really long time, I've been fascinated with sports psychology and and psychology just in general, mental performance and stuff. I would say it probably started when I was 12 or 13. There was a, Mm -hmm. we had a massive, there was a big tournament and they brought in a sports psychologist to do a presentation for all the teams. So this massive auditorium, people from all over the world or all over the country, I guess. And the stuff that the psychologist was talking about then was it just hit me really hard and i could i couldn't remember i can't remember verbatim what the the message was but a lot of it was very similar to what we talk about now but just a much more kind of simplified less complex version because obviously it's a an hour long presentation you only have so much time right uh and so for me that's been a huge thing so as soon as i realized that i wasn't going to be able to handle healthily handle the stress of doing what I want to do on a day to day basis, I, I got to be honest, it was 100% buy in. And it was literally just a, okay, am I going to vibe with this person? And, yeah. you know, obviously, I thought we got on really well. And it was like, okay, cool, I'm bought in, let's do this. Because yeah. I know that it's gonna like I from so long ago, I was like, I know this is such a big part of a game. And yeah. I just need to just totally buy in. So yeah. I would say, honestly, that's the only hesitation I ever had was like, whether we get along or not. That's it. Yeah. No, for sure. And I think it's it's also knowing when to like make the jump of like, oh, I'm interested in this. Oh, now I want to do this work and work with somebody. And that's sure. sometimes we call that like the mosquito getting bit with the mosquito awareness bug. Like it's like, oh, now I'm aware, like, oh, I could really work on my mental game. And if yeah. I want to work on it, then let's get someone that I can work with and get coaching so I can get quick and effective um progress on it. And I think the the funny thing I was uh, noting this the other day, like an up and coming basketball player, he's in his late teens and he's trying to go into double A stuff. And uh, he he told his parents, he goes, he's a real person. <laughs> like, he's like, it was kind of, I was like, Oh, that's a nice compliment. And in, in a lot of ways, yeah. sometimes people think, uh, you know, the, the mental game coach or sports psychology idea. It's like, Oh, that person's going to be so dry. And it's uh, no, we want to make, it's it, we're just people working, coaching together and, uh, and, and get along that way. So, okay. That's great. Last couple of questions here. Now, uh, any surprise benefits? So, and maybe you could, that can also tie into, you know, outside of sport and life, some of these mm-hmm. principles applying there or, or anywhere else where you're like, Oh, I really enjoy. And this was a, an extra benefit that I wasn't expecting. <laughs> Mood after a really crap training session mm-hmm. and after a loss. 
Yeah. I would say those are like those. And, and to be fair, even, even a win, I would say on both ends that I, I keep coming back to that nightmare fantasy, yeah. uh, sort of the fallacy of that and being able to, you know, I'm, I'm married. I, we've been married now almost two years and, um, being able to just sit down with my wife after a game at the dinner table and just chill and like talk about whatever and not be so consumed with all this stuff. Whereas now I feel like I can go, you know, obviously I want to win. I'm an incredibly competitive person. That's, you know, that's a given. And also once the game's over, it's over. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm not going to complain about the referees. I can't, you know, there's it's that's all out of my control. What is in my control though, is continuing to have a beautiful blossoming relationship with my wife and my mm-hmm. friends who I can see or family or whoever afterwards. And then I can say, okay, what's also in my control is going and watching the game film, improving the next week on what I needed to focus on, blah, 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 whatever it is. Like that's, it's so much, it's honestly a relief now because I'm not so so consumed with the emotions of the ups and downs of wins and losses. And I'm like, nah, like I got a life to live outside of football. Like I gotta, I gotta enjoy life outside of football just as much as I do in it. Yeah. No, I love that perspective because it's it's actually quite a common thing. Athletes Mm -hmm. are so driven and then you just what weighs on you and carry that away from the pitch, from, uh, from your sport. So glad to hear that last two questions here, realizing what you know now, what would you say to either your younger self or up and coming athletes that might be listening uh, in terms of their mental game and, and transforming their on field performance by working on their mindset, their mental game, any tips to your younger self or upcoming athletes uh, that might be listening? Definitely. I would say that a, my head coach can only teach me so much. I'm at the point in my game where I am, I'm not naive to think I know everything because I don't. Mm-hmm. he's much more advanced as far as tactics and stuff go, but my job is to fit into his system. And there's only, you know, there's a, there's sort of a ceiling of sorts of like how, you know, based on his structure, what I can do on the pitch and here's what his instructions are, blah, 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 blah. There is literally limitless benefits to working with us working together, right? Mm-hmm. Like there are so many things off the pitch, on the pitch, whether it's business stuff we've spoken about, whether it's, you know, my, the things that I'm trying to do with my wife and my family. And like, there's, there's so many things that performance coach, like mental performance coaches can help with. And I would say that it's something I wish I would have maybe gone into earlier just cause, uh, but again, it's, there's a right time for everything and, and everyone's gonna, gonna find their way there. But I think I, I would hope that younger players start to really focus in on the, the, the stuff that matters, which is mindset and then everything else kind of falls into place. Like for me, that's the biggest thing. Cause you can frame your entire existence based on that. Yeah. No, I love that. And last couple of things here, one for your season coming up, what's next for your mental game. I know we can't <laughs> predict the future, but I think it's good to highlight. It's like, it's not like the work's done and you've kind of alluded to of that. We've personalized your scorecard there. That's going to keep, there's going to be different iterations maybe some weeks and months, not as much. And some weeks could be, new, could be some bigger changes. Any yep. thoughts in terms of just highlighting, you know, I, I know we're, you know, we're continuing to work together, but just thoughts on moving forward for yourself, your own career and, and how you're approaching the mental game this season. It's a, with a new season that we're, you're just getting kickstarted here now. Yeah. I think for me, it's going to be about maximizing impact and versus minimizing mistakes. We spoke about that last week in our meeting. And for me, that was super helpful in my, the the role shift that I've experienced in the last couple of weeks. And so being able to continue to push and continue to improve and continue to uh, sort of what I say is like, to, to gap myself, you know, my, my previous self last year was a certain version of that player. And I want to make sure that this year's player is so much more impactful, so much more locked in, you know, as, as much as I possibly can be. So that's, for me, it's just about cl- continuing to step forward and understand that there's always, always, always things to learn. Yeah, no, I love that. And I love the maximize impact over, you know, focusing on minimizing mistakes and, and, and risk adverse. So last thing then, if you have anything else you want to add, feel free to share, but obviously, you know, give the opportunity to shout out your own 
you got your own YouTube channel and you're doing all kinds of cool stuff online, your own personal brand. Do you want to just uh, share the links and URLs or, or whatever you want to uh, shout, shout out for that? Yeah. So it's just Noah Cabin on YouTube. That's all. And then uh, on Instagram as well. I just love to share not only tactical stuff, but life as a professional. I do boot reviews and all that stuff. So really trying to share what I enjoy off the field and, and, and in a lot of ways that actually helps detach as well. Cause I don't, <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm just focused on having fun, like the YouTube stuff. Yes, it's a business, but it's also really creative. And so I'm able to just enjoy football outside the context of the job. And so mm-hmm. for me, that's, that's fantastic. So yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a cool, it's a cool platform. So I enjoy it. Awesome. We'll make sure we'll yeah. put the links in the, in the write-up and stuff. So thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. No, I appreciate you sharing and, uh, and sharing your journey experiences. You know, there's lots of good takeaways there for any athlete, let alone professional athletes and any final thoughts before we wrap up. I would just say you're never too young or too inexperienced to dive into it. Cause I think the, the more you can do earlier, the, the better. And I would say that the, the athletes that I know who work with sports performance coaches and sports psychologists and all that stuff are far and away more locked in humans in and out of their sport. Yeah. No, I love that. Great finish. Thank you so much. 